Now, uh, while Dr. Garib loads his presentation, you can all see the certificates at the back, so can I. Uh, I don't think he really needs an introduction, but I would like to say that he is one of the gurus of thyroid. Um, he has published more than 200 papers and three endocrine books, including the thyroid nodule in 2017. Um, I can almost bet money that it is difficult to attend an endocrine conference without him being a speaker on there. He is, uh, he has been the past president of American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, American College of Endocrinology, as well as the American Thyroid Association. Um, while he's loading up his presentation, I had the chance to see Dr. Garib for the first time as uh, in Endocrine University as a second year fellow. And I was very impressed by not just the fact that he made research look so easy, but he was also a true clinician who cared about his patients, which is a rare combination and something to aspire to. Dr. Garib, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation and for the introduction. Uh, I must say that I have been at, at Cleveland Clinic many times for the past 20 years as a speaker at your annual uh, endocrine intensive endocrine uh, review course. It has always been a pleasure. And I must say that every time I go to Cleveland Clinic campus, I see more buildings. So I don't know what to do with all of this. <laughs> so good morning to everyone. And uh, the title of the talk is a century of advances in thyroid cancer. It seems very ambitious for 45 minutes and it, to cover uh, the advances uh, in one century of thyroid treatment. But I think that we will achieve the goal. Uh, I have, uh, an, uh, I hope, an, uh, an informative presentation for you. Uh, thank you for the invitation and I have nothing to disclose. Uh, so here are the objectives of my talk. Uh, how do we explain the increased prevalence of thyroid cancer? Uh, what about the modalities for treatment? Thyroid hormone, thyroid surgery, radioiodine treatment, and what has happened in the past century with regards to each of these? And obviously, we'll have to be brief and, and briefly the, discuss these. And then, what about the increased uh, risk for recurrences in thyroid cancer? How do we explain these? And finally, a brief comment on what is the current recommendation for papillary thyroid microcarcinoma? So we start here with the importance of thyroid cancer. You see here in 2020, we have 92,000 cases of thyroid cancer, most, mostly in women, some in men. And then the estimated uh, uh, the prevalence is 183,000, so almost double the number in, uh, in 10 years, in a decade. And what will we look at in, 2000, in 2030? Thyroid will be number two cancer in women and number three in men. So it is common, it is prevalent, and uh, uh, therefore it deserves attention. Now, it's also important that the projected death rate is around 2000 and stable. So this uh, graph that I'm sure you have seen before shows that in the past four decades, there has been a progressive increase in the, the diagnosis of, of thyroid cancer. And here you see that in the past four decades, survival has been excellent and even improving, going from 92% to 90, almost 98%. And so there has been a progressive increase. This tells us that maybe what we are diagnosing in this decades are the small tumors that are eminently treatable. So what do we, what can we tell about the increased incidence of thyroid cancer? It is mainly due to uh, the application of uh, screening programs, widespread use of sensitive imaging, uh, it is uh, uh, also um, uh, because of, mostly because of the increased incidence and diagnosis of papillary thyroid microcarcinoma. Mortality seems to be relatively stable, although some studies suggest that there may be a slight increase in, 
in the last decade or so. And then when you look at the prevalence of uh, red PTC mutations, there is decrease, and this would suggest that there is decreased ionizing exposure. So radiation does not seem to be an explanation for the increased incidence. In fact, there is increase in point mutations, such as VRAF, which suggests chemical exposure. So the, uh, the papillary thyroid uh, carcinoma accounts for the majority of thyroid cancers, and this will be the focus of our attention today. So conventional treatment is thyroidectomy. A uh, patient uh, then uh, uh, gets radioiodine ablation, on thyroxine therapy with TSH suppression, and follow up with ultrasound and TG. So what has happened in the past century for thyroid cancer? Thyroid extract documented to be effective 100 years ago. In the 1940s, radioiodine treatment was added. The modifications in thyroid surgery and its application to thyroid uh, cancer management, introduction of, um, of thyroid uh, ultrasound and of thyroglobulin. And then there are other areas that I will not cover, but I will cover percutaneous ethanol injection, which was introduced two decades ago in thyroid practice. So we'll start with thyroid hormone therapy. In fact, uh, George Murray uh, started thyroid hormone in a hypothyroid patient 30 years before this publication. But this publication in 1920 documented that results were very good. So this was the first case of mixedema treated and the follow-up and the, the publication given. So what is the current recommendation for thyroid hormone therapy in thyroid cancer? For those that are, have low risk thyroid cancer, the sinum TSH is somewhere between 0 0.5 and 2. And then for intermediate risk, we want to keep TSH a little bit lower, uh, less than 0 0.5. And then for high risk, uh, obviously, as the case that was described, uh, consistently less than 0 0.1. And then when you're following a patient and look at the response to treatment and the progress of disease, then you can modify. And so a patient who has had no recurrence after five or eight years or 10 years, you can lower a thyroxine dose to keep TSH in the low normal range. In patients who have high risk disease, they have poor response to treatment, or they have aggressive uh, disease at the beginning, then target TSH will be and should be 0 0.1 and remain so for the balance of treatment. What has happened to thyroid surgery? Well, uh, Blake Katie was one of the pioneers of, uh, of thyroid surgery at Leahy Clinic. Uh, he practiced for almost four decades. His uh, impression was that uh, th thyroid cancer, most of, thyroid cancers are not very aggressive and that uh, limited surgery can be effective. And he also observed that lymph node metastases not only were not harmful, but may even uh, offer a protective effect, something that is disputed. But the important message that Katie gave us was that uh, in your treatment, do not be as, uh, as surgeons very aggressive. Follow-up to Katie's observations, then Ernie Mazzaferi uh, uh, at Ohio State reviewed and, uh, and made the observation that thyroidectomy is helpful and that total thyroidectomy is probably better than, uh, than a partial thyroidectomy in terms of recurrences and deaths. So Mazzaferi emphasized the fact that A, thyroid surgery is important, in his review of data, he felt that more surgery is better at the time. This is back in the 1950s and 60s. A lot of contribution was made by two clinics, Cleveland Clinic. I'm, unfortunately, I don't have time to review George Kyle's uh, uh, contributions to thyroid cancer, but I have two slides on 
from Mayo. Mayo was also important in the initial recommendations for thyroid uh, cancer treatment. So Lou Wolner was a famous thyroid pathologist. His observation was that patients have th lobectomy to total thyroidectomy. Sometimes they are followed and that thyroid uh, lymph node metastasis are commonly seen in patients uh, have uh, thyroid cancer, mostly papillary. In those decades, load picking or berry picking, selective uh, dissection was, uh, was more involved. And the observation of Dr. Woolner and colleagues was that papillary thyroid carcinoma is remarkably curable. In general, surgical procedures have been conservative and results have been satisfactory. So it looks like now the evolution of more conservative, less aggressive surgical treatment. And then finally, the, my colleague, Dr. Hay, in his observations noted that in neither the minimal or higher risk groups of papillary thyroid carcinoma, survival is significantly improved by total thyroidectomy. Again, emphasizing that we don't need to be surgically very aggressive. So what are current recommendations? So the, these recommendations are based on the recent, most recent ATA recommendations. So either lobectomy or total thyroidectomy acceptable for patients with PTC, uh, depending on risk factors, patient preferences, availability of surgical expertise, or if you have mutation information. In general, if tumors are less than one, are less than four centimeters, uh, they, they exhibit no extra thyroidal extension. No lymph nodes are demonstrated um, at the time of uh, examination. Initial treatment may be either lobectomy or total thyroidectomy. For larger tumors with more aggressive behavior, uh, lymph nodes uh, extension, etc., uh, total thyroidectomy would be more appropriate. So what about lobectomy as initial surgery? Uh, lobectomy seems to be acceptable if tumor is uh, small, unifocal, intrathyroidal, and low-risk carcinoma. Um, when post-op radioiodine is not planned for a, a 1.5 centimeter uh, unifocal tumor, then lobectomy would be appropriate, and radioiodine then would not be necessary for remnant ablation. And of course, complication rates are lower, uh, considering that majority, 80% of thyroidectomies are performed by low volume surgeons in the country. So in places like Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, or large uh, clinics elsewhere, where there is uh, uh, expertise and high volume surgeons available, uh, risk for uh, total thyroidectomy is almost, almost as low as lobectomy. But in the country as a whole, one has to take this into account that complications may be high. And so lobectomy would be a reasonable choice for uh, some patients. So why should we consider total thyroidectomy? Well, the argument is that papillary thyroid cancer can be multifocal or bilateral, and therefore it would be desirable to remove all the tumor that is uh, potentially present. Uh, so, um, if there is a tumor present and you do lobectomy, there may be a uh, need for completion thyroidectomy uh, at another time. And so, to avoid a second stage operation, let's do total thyroidectomy at the beginning. There are some data, initial data that I presented uh, briefly, uh, that recurrence rates may be lower when you do total thyroidectomy. And so, that those point to uh, support the concept that total thyroidectomy may be a, a better procedure. And of course, complications are not uh, higher than uh, lobectomy when the operation is performed by experienced high volume surgeons. So, if we do lobectomy, then how do we follow these patients? Because obviously, TG levels are not very reliable, and ultrasound may not uh, necessarily show any development in the neck as good as patients post 
total fire effect. I mean, so we say TSH goal is uh, usually partial TSH suppression um, in patients who have low risk disease uh, for clinic visits. Uh, we, our recommendation is that patients return for uh, in six to 12 months for uh, check TSH and thyroglobulin and every two to three years to return for follow-up exam that would also include neck ultrasound uh, in six to 12 months and periodically thereafter. So uh, the management of a patient with lobectomy is a little bit different than patients who undergo more ra radical surgery. What about the role of radioiodine treatment in thyroid cancer? So it started in 1940 in Boston at Mass General and Dr. Saul Hertz is uh, credited with um, offering and studying and offering treatment uh, in patients with thyroid cancer. In a nice review, Earl Chapman in 1983, uh, almost 35 years ago, uh, described the history of discovery and use of radioactive iodine. So again, early Mazaferi gets credit for bringing this in, in to attention of clinicians, saying that patients who have papillary thyroid carcinoma and they get uh, thyroid hormone, there is, there, there is improved survival. But if you add thyroid hormone to radioiodine, then your survival is even uh, further improved. So in patients in general, use of thyroid hormone, in general use of radioiodine would offer improvement. So since then, of course, this is 45 years ago, since then there have been our understanding that low risk thyroid cancer does not. And that is the, the critic, critic, criticism of early Mazaferi's early and very important contributions that he lumped everything together. Well, of course, that was the state of art at that time. So what about radioiodine in current thyroid practice? We say there is remnant ablation to destroy post-surgical thyroid remnant. The dose is somewhere between 30 and 150 millicuries. There is adjuvant therapy when there is documented residual post-op disease. The usual recommended dose is 150. And then there is metastatic disease, obviously, which requires often 200 millicuries, and in most states requires admission inpatient treatment. This is a typical scan of a patient post-op. This is a P view uh, and AP and PA view showing the thyroid remnant. There's a slight amount of uptake in uh, the um, uh, salivary glands in the stomach and in bladder, and there is this marker for uh, uh, giving us the marker for the radioiodine uptake. This is a patient that this patient would be treated with small dose for remnant for 30 to 50 millicuries. This is another patient that has on post-op radioiodine scan two areas, thyroid remnant and a lymph node. This patient would receive the adjuvant therapy probably 150 millicuries would be appropriate. So who needs remnant ablation? It is not routinely recommended for patients that have low risk papillary thyroid carcinoma or papillary thyroid microcarcinoma. It should be considered for intermediate risk papillary cancer, and it should be considered uh, routinely for high risk PTC. It is not recommended if patient has had partial thyroidectomy, we do not destroy remnant lobe by radioiodine, and it is not necessary after thyroidectomy for multifocal disease if disease is uh, microcarcinoma. A few years ago, um, multifocal disease was recommended to undergo radioiodine treatment, but not but no longer. So what about, why, why is it that we say low risk disease should, does not need remnant ablation? Well, here is one study from Mayo, uh, radioiodine remnant ablation in a large group of patients with low risk 
uh, differentiated thyroid cancer, looking at two uh, endpoints, mortality and recurrences. Some of these patients had were node negative, some were node positive. Some had uh, partial, some had total thyroidectomy. So when you look at these, then they, those who were node negative or node positive did not seem to benefit for mortality in low risk patients who were treated or not treated with radioiodine. And then in terms of recurrences, there seemed to be no impact even for those patients who were not positive. And so the conclusion from this and many other studies is that number one, in patients with low risk uh, thyroid cancer, uh, radioiodine remnant ablation is not indicated. It does not improve mortality. It does not improve recurrences. And so if you were to use those radioiodine, current recommendations are that you use the lowest dose, which is run between 30 to 50 millicuries of radioiodine. And of course, parenthetically, I will add that current practice, a recombinant TSH is used more commonly than withdrawal. So what about uh, increasing recurrences of thyroid cancer? Why is it that we see more recurrences? Well, this is a recent uh, study from Mayo showing that regional recurrences, which means either in the thyroid bed or in lymph nodes versus distant metastasis in children and in adults. This is a study that shows current recurrences, 50% for children, regional, and almost uh, 5% or so in uh, the distant metastasis. Well, what were those recurrences in uh, 30 to 50 years ago? This recurrences in children were almost unheard of in regional disease. Distant metastasis were less, as were both in adults as well, both regional and distant metastasis. So what do we contribute this increased recurrences to? So the use of imaging is the main engine behind the, the discovery. So here it is, use of imaging, um, increasing use of imaging is also associated with increased diagnosis and increased treatment, as you would expect. So here, what kind of a treatment is offered? Uh, uh, radioiodine treatment or surgery uh, or even radiotherapy, all modalities seem to increase as you apply more imaging and you diagnose more disease. So what have we learned from these additional treatments for patients with thyroid cancer? Sometimes they are beneficial Repeated doses of radioiodine seldom cures patients. Most patients have persistent disease even after repeated neck dissections. There is no clear evidence of improved disease-free survival, but small incidence of clinically significant side effects do occur and um, uh, cause uh, increased uh, the Diagnosis and treatment causes anxiety for both the physician and the patient, and obviously increases cost of care. So what has happened to our practice, and why is it that we are diagnosing? That goes back to thyroglobulin and ultrasound. So the introduction of these tests have significantly changed, and in most cases improved, uh, patients with thyroid nodules and cancer. So Van Hurley is uh, recognized as the father of thyroglobulin assay. In the early 1980s, he introduced TG in thyroid practice. At that time, TG uh, had a sensitivity of three. Current TG sensitivity is for 0 0.1. So this increased sensitivity has been both a blessing and a curse, because now we, with, with very high sensitivity, 
uh, we almost never look at a cure in a patient with thyroid cancer. And so serum TG uh, is current in current practice is very high at sensitive TG assays. Uh, TG antibodies continue to cause the conundrum because when TG antibodies are present, TG uh, levels cannot be uh, determined. Um, clinicians uh, face the dilemma of managing patients with TG positive, scan negative, which is often a difficult management issue. What to do with a patient whose TG is rising, but imaging remains negative. And then post-op TG levels have shown us that they are valuable in predicting outcome. For example, this study and similar studies show that post-op levels of TG show us the following, that if post-op TG within three to six months is less than uh, one, 99% will be almost persistently low in follow-up. Whereas the TG levels are between one and five, half of these patients will be disease-free and the other half will show disease. So the immediate, in the, in the six months post-op TG measurement gives you a fairly good assessment of what is going to come in the near future or long-term management. And then what happens to TG levels as you follow patients? In other words, if TG levels are high, what happens? So as you see here, gradually there is a decline in without any additional treatment. So if TG levels are one, two or three or five immediately post-op, one has to be patient because many of these patients continue to show decline in TG levels. And so, how do we look at a patient uh, as, as the case was described earlier uh, in this session? Well, excellent response is one that uh, suppressed TG is uh, when patient is on thyroxine is undetectable. If you stimulate by withdrawing thyroxine or by giving recombinant TSH, TG would be still less than one. TG antibodies are negative and remain negative and imaging, usually with ultrasound, is negative. So with this picture, the clinical outcome is that there is less than 4% recurrence rate, uh, rates and uh, less than 1% disease-specific death rate. What about ultrasound? Well, I considered Dr. Jack Baskin, my friend and colleague from Florida, uh, as the father of ultrasound, at least in thyroid practice. He was the person who in the early 1970s and 80s promoted the use of ultrasound, not only in thyroid practice, but by endocrinologists and by clinicians. So thyroid ultrasound today is widespread uh, use in, in thyroid practice. Many endocrinologists use uh, thyroid ultrasound in their, in their office when patients come for diagnosis of thyroid disease and follow up with thyroid cancer. Thyroid ultrasound should be performed in all patients who are known or suspected to have thyroid nodules, and thyroid ultrasound should be uh, done preoperatively in all patients who undergo treat, uh, surgical treatment for thyroid cancer. As again, in this case uh, presented earlier, illustrated, this patient was specifically looked for by uh, for adenopathy, and that's what we do. So all patients should have uh, ultrasound pre-op looking for not only the thyroid mass, but for uh, adenopathy in large lymph nodes. Risk of malignancy, uh, experienced uh, uh, sonographers can give you a uh, risk of all by, by the appearance of a thyroid nodule or uh, lymph nodes if this is benign or malignant. And of course, we, you, we use FNA to confirm or rule out uh, metastatic disease. This assessment has been offered by multiple groups. AACE has uh, had uh, uh, the suggestions, uh, American College of Radiology, ATA, some European groups. So it just depends on 
which one you are comfortable with and you want to use for risk of assessment. So this is a thyroid nodule. We have now used the Bethesda system. The Bethesda system is a six tier classification with previously four tier classification and subdivides the suspicious group into three groups, low risk and high risk. And again, helps the clinician in managing a patient with thyroid nodule and cytology. And uh, here is Bethesda and we have compared our data with, with Bethesda and they are pretty much consistent. So what about uh, management options in patients with papillary thyroid microcarcinoma? Treatment seems to uh, uh, be uh, lobectomy, uh, central neck dissection is usually not indicated, radioiodine remnant ablation is not recommended, and outcome remains excellent. This is data from Mayo showing that in a large group of patients with papillary thyroid microcarcinoma, tumors were uh, less than one centimeter, 27% were multifocal, 30% were node positive, 1.3% were invasive, and this metastasis infrequent, less than 1%. And very few over long period of follow-up died of uh, cancer. Overall recurrence was 7%, and uh, more common if uh, nodes were positive in uh, recurrent disease at the, uh, at the beginning if nodes were positive. And 99% are not at risk for distant metastasis. Surgery can be lobectomy, bilateral resection, or total thyroidectomy. 10% in our experience receive radioiodine remnant ablation, mostly in the past decades. And the best recommendation here, according to this group, is uh, lobectomy. So, uh, ATA recent recommendation for surgery for thyroid cancer said if, and they are the, uh, they had if they put it here, which means that if patient has um, a small tumor, uh, then maybe you don't have to offer. Surgery. So it says if surgery is chosen. And the reason for that was the observations by uh, Miyachi and colleagues from Japan who showed that patients who have papillary microcarcinoma, microcarcinoma, some may go immediate surgery, and that has been, of course, our more conventional practice. Some may not want to do it when they were offered observation, and many of these stayed about the same. So it seemed that an alternative to immediate surgery for micropapillary microcarcinoma could be observation and follow-up, careful follow-up. So we call this active surveillance. This is not uh, uh, palliative care or watchful waiting. This is like a small prostate cancer that aggressively is followed and even treated if necessary. And therapy, when it is indicated, is still effective. So this is an alternative to immediate surgery for patients with papillary thyroid microcarcinoma. We call this active surveillance. The ideal candidate is one who is older than 60, has a solitary nodule, well-defined margins, no extra thyroid extension, and no adenopathy by clinical exam. So this is a follow-up of patients with uh, papillary thyroid microcarcinoma that were followed. I want to draw your attention to, this is more than 10 years, to the group that is older than 60. When they are followed 10 years or more, increase in size in 2%. Appearance of lymph node metastasis, warranting surgical in, in, intervention less than 1%. Progression to clinical disease on, in overall outcome, 1.5%. So if your patient is 60 or older, watchful follow-up of papillary microcarcinoma seems to be a very reasonable protocol. For younger patients, it will also be okay 
but the chance for progression is around 10%. And so, Medical management of high suspicion nodules, uh, medical management can be offered to a patient if a tumor is less than one centimeter, if location is non subcapsular. Subcapsular makes it difficult, and if tumor grows, may in become invasive. No adenopathy present, older patients, a patient who is willing um, to um, um, is uh, the, the first surgery. And uh, it will be compliant with follow up. What about managing local recurrences? When local recurrences occur, they are mostly in the thyroid bed or in the lymph nodes in the neck. Uh, and when they occur, you can follow them if they're asymptomatic, stable, or small, or you could refer them to your ENT or, or endocrine surgical colleagues for uh, select neck dissection. Or I'd like to discuss the third option, which would be minimally invasive treatment. So a percutaneous alcohol injection can be used uh, as an alternative to surgery. It is image guided and some clinics have experience with this. So most commonly it is employed for PTC and there is good re re result and good uh, response to treatment. It may shrink or arrest growth for many years. It does require training and it is offered in a special clinics and side effects are very low and cost is low. And so a report from Mayo, uh, uh, we have used this for 20 years in um, neck nodal metastasis in uh, 25 patients and 37 cases uh, of uh, this treatment was very effective as you see here. 95% uh, decreased volume recurrences and 46% completely disappeared. And this is an example of a patient that I saw a couple of years ago. Here is the uh, lymph node, the, the re recurrence, and this is 75% by volume decrease in size here. And this patient I have followed now for uh, five years, and uh, there has been no problems in the neck. So it is effective, and it is something that should be considered in patients who have uh, cervical recurrence. So my concluding remarks. So what is cure in papillary thyroid cancer considering the uh, very sensitive uh, uh, TG assays and very sensitive ultrasound, it may be very difficult to find a patient who has complete cure. So we have to accept our, our convince ourselves that small volume disease, uh, no threat to patient, can be followed and can be easily managed medically. So what have I seen in my practice for more than four decades in thyroid practice, that we have developed a higher threshold for thyroid nodule biopsy. As you know, we no, no longer recommend biopsying a nodule that is less than one centimeter, even if suspected to be malignant. If patients have uh, nodules that are two or three centimeter and these nodules um, are spongiform, no biopsy is needed. And so we have developed, we, we use ultrasound, we find nodules, but uh, we have developed a higher threshold for biopsy. We now recommend lobectomy for low risk papillary thyroid cancer, whether it is uh, microcarcinoma or not. We use selective use, recommend selective use of uh, uh, radioiodine for remnant ablation. In patients that have papillary thyroid microcarcinoma, medical follow-up would be an appropriate alternative if patients are more than 60 years of age. We recommend partial TSA suppression for low risk PTC or non recurrent PTC, and then alcohol ablation for low volume cervical recurrence. So, what has happened to our management? Between 1920 and 2000, thyroidectomy, radical neck, external beam radiation, extensive surgery, repeated surgical treatments. And then in the past two decades, we are learning more and we are standardizing 
autosan and FNA classification, so everybody is in the same boat. Surveillance instead of intervention for papillary microcarcinoma. For treatment of low risk papillary thyroid carcinoma with lobectomy, uh, we often recommend no radio iron ablation. We recommend partial TSA suppression and follow these patients with periodic TSH, TG, and ultrasound. And then um, we recommend non no treatment or minimally invasive treatment for local recurrence and such as uh, alcohol ablation. Now, um, in addition to alcohol ablation, radiofrequency treatment uh, or, or laser treatment is also used in Europe, but I guess in the US, I have not heard that this is used. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for the invitation to talk to your group, and uh, I'll be happy to entertain questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Gareeb. Uh, we That was a very comprehensive presentation on thyroid cancer, uh, and it was very interesting to see how, what are the possible causes of the increasing incidence that we are seeing, as well as the fact that now we are not looking at a cure, we are looking at more like a control. So as a fellow clinician, what I would like to ask you is, how do you tell your patient that we might not get a biochemical cure? Right. So, First of all, um, many of our patients have already consulted Dr. Google. So patients <laughs> nowadays, you know, when they come to see you, they mm -hmm. actually are pretty well informed. So we, I, I tell them I, when, when, when I have an ultrasound images in, available in my office with the patient, there are some tiny spots in the neck or there's one lymph node that is uh, not threatening. I tell them this could be, but we will follow. And most of our patients are uh, compliant. They return for follow-up in six months or a year and for long-term management. So they understand. If the patient is anxious and the patient wants to know, we'll be more than happy to do biopsy when uh, it is indicated and or, or even offer the uh, treatment. But many do understand that if this is a small uh, recurrence, if this is something that can be watched, they would be happy to, to go along with us. Okay. But you, are, but you are right. Uh, patient anxiety should always be considered in the formula for management. And, um, and patients differ. One person may be comfortable, another may want to have that little spot of potential cancer removed. Um, the other thing, I think we are all seeing these microscopic thyroid cancers because of all the biopsies we are all doing. And you mentioned that um, the more, uh, the optimal treatment in terms of surgery is a lobectomy rather than a total thyroidectomy. And you mentioned following TGs over time. So I presuming these TGs are not going to be negative. So you are following them for stability of the TGs of the thyroglobulin? Uh, uh, you mean in patients with lobectomy or? Yes, uh, yes. Okay, in, in patients with lobectomy, you can still use TG level uh, as a measure for um, uh, potential recurrence. TG levels obviously will not be zero or undetectable, mm -hmm. but, but you can measure them. They may be three, four, or five, and the trend would be important. So if you're following a patient who is on thyroxine therapy, TG is four in a patient who had lobectomy, that TG level should remain relatively stable through the follow-up years. If TG begins to rise, the trend shows that there is an increase, then you want to worry and do more extensive evaluation. So TG is uh, useful, not as useful but it is still useful if there is uh, lobectomy and for patients uh, follow-up can be used as a measure of disease persistence or recurrence and so forth. Okay, all right. 
Um, well, I don't think we have any more questions. Thank you so much for logging in so early um, so that you could present to us. We really enjoyed your presentation and hopefully